Okay, the reading for this week is a, uh, the very first example of the Utaniki. And the Utaniki is the uh, poetic, poetic diary genre that was first uh, invented in the Heian period. And the very first example of the Utaniki, uh, or po poetic diary, is this work that we're about to read uh, by uh, Kino Tsurayuki, called the Tosa Niki, or the Tosa Diary. Uh, it, it was written around 935 at the height of the Heian period, and it, as always I will put the uh, years of the various uh, important Japanese eras in of the eras of Japanese history in the description below, so you can make sure you have memorized all the main eras to date. So this is a work from the height of the Heian period, Tosaniki by Kino Tsurayuki. And we've already read in this class several of the Kikobun, or travel uh, literature, works by Ma the great poet of the Edo period, Matsuo Basho, and his famous Kikobun are kind of modeled after these Utaniki that were first uh, written in the Heian period. So we want to uh, keep in mind some of the similarities of Matsuo Basho's later uh, works that were written much later in the Kikobun genre, and note the similarities between the Kikobun genre and the Utaniki. Okay, so this uh, records, this work here, records in a mix of vernacular, prose, and 57 waka poems, his journey, Kino Tsurayuki's own journey um, around Japan, uh, starting in Kyoto, I think, if I remember correctly, in the capital of Japan at the time, going out into the provinces, in Tosa, and then back again, although I can't remember if he comes back again, I might have the order wrong, we'll look at that later, but keep in mind, Tosa is in what is today uh, in uh, Shikoku, and we'll go over some of the, uh, the actual map of his journey in class together. And I have yet to make a study guide for this work. I'll make that later and then make a separate video with the uh, study guide in which I explain a little bit more about this, sto about this work and its background, historical background, literary background, and uh, some questions that will have you delve deep, uh, deep more, a little bit more deeply into the work. So in this video, it's just going to be the recitation. Uh, by my student assistant, Nico Tsang. Okay, and uh, Okay, let me figure out what we're doing. Sure you don't know what okay, and Nico Tsang, I will now turn the headphones over to you. And, and oh, one more thing. Keep in mind that this is not the entire work. Uh, it would take hours to read the entire work. We're going to read some of the more famous and salient ep episodes from the work. And the translation is by Donald Keane. I'll put information or a link to the. Uh, full translation in the description below, as always, so you can purchase it and read the work in full. So these are some of the more uh, famous excerpts from the work. And as always, you will have the PDF file, so read along with the PDF file. You have the English translation by Donald Keane on the left side, and the original Japanese, uh, classical Japanese on the right side. So we'll go over both in class. Okay, turning over the mic now to Nicole San. File and ready. Uh, let's go. So Tosaniki by Kino Tsurayuki. Okay. Tosaniki by Kino Tsurayuki, who was born in 872 and died in 945. I intend to see whether a woman can produce one of those diaries men are said to write. The departure took place during the hour of the dog, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m., on the 21st of the 12th month in a certain year. I will set down a few notes about the journey. Having come to the end of a four- or five-year tour of a provincial duty, a man finished the usual task, got a clearance, and set out from his official residence toward the port of embarkation. A throng of acquaintances and strangers saw him off. People who had been close to him during the past years were especially reluctant to say goodbye. The whole day was hectic, and there was still much commotion when it began to get late. On the 22nd, prayers were offered for a safe voyage as far as Izumi province. Even though the journey was to be made by boat, Fujiwara no Tokizane pointed the horse's nose. People of all classes imbibed generously and made spectacles of themselves, stinking drunk, oddly enough, beside the salty sea. The 23rd day. A man by the name of Yagi no Yasunori, who apparently had no connection with the provincial government, nevertheless made a splendid presentation of gifts. Possibly because some of the shortcomings on the government, governor's part, most of the local residents had dropped out of sight as soon as his term ended but this admirable man risked embarrassment to come. I praise him not merely because he brought presents. The 24th day. The head month of the province came to present gifts. Everyone got staggering drunk, the high, the low, and the very children. 
People who did not even know the character one wrote ten with their feet. The 25th day. Someone brought a letter of invitation from the governor's residence. The former governor went and was entertained for a day and a night. The 26th day. There was another grand banquet at the governor's residence which present with presents for everyone, servants and all. People chanted Chinese poems and the host, the guest of honor, and the others exchanged Japanese poems. I cannot record the Chinese ones, but the host composes this one in Japanese. Miyako idete, kimi ni awamuto, koshi mono o, koshi kai mono naku, ware nuruka na. I left the city and found my way to this place, longing to meet you. Yet my journey was in vain, for now we must say farewell. The departing ex governor recited, Shiro tae no nami ji o toku, yuki kaite. Ware ni nibiki wa tare nare na, nare, nara na kuni. Will you not one day do as I am doing now, for you who have come here, far along the white wave paths, as another ventures forth? There were also poems by others, but I doubt they accounted too much. After talking a while, the two governors descended the steps, clasping hands, clasped hands, and wished one another well in hearty voices somewhat worse for drink. Then the one started off, and the other went back inside. The 27th day. The boat rode out from Otsu towards Urado. During the, the bustle of departure and the other events of those days, one member of the party had looked in, on in silence, thinking of a little girl born in the capital who had died suddenly in the province. It ought to have been the cause of joy to be sitting out, setting out toward the city, but the parent was lost in grief for the absent child. The others were deeply sympathetic. A certain person wrote a poem and brought it out. Miyako eto omou mono o kanashiki wa kaeru na no hito no areba narikeri. At long last, I think, we head toward the capital, yet this sadness because of one among us who will not be going home. Again, another time. Aru mono to wasuretsu na o naki hito o izura to 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 tozo. Kanashiki karikeru. Kanashi karikeru. Sharper still the grief when the forgetful parent, thinking her alive, asks where she can have gone, the child whose days have ended. Meanwhile, at a palace called Kakunosaki, the boat was overtaken by the new governor's brother and some other men who came bringing wine and such. The former governor, governor went ashore and sat with them on the beach, where they all lamented the necessity of parting. One felt inclined to, the, to agree with those who had called them the friendliest people at the governor's house. After the usual exchange of civilities, the party from the residence composed a poem on the beach, helping one another like fishermen dragging a net. Oshito omu, hito yo tomaru to, ashigamo no uchimurete koso, ware wa kimi kere. Hoping against hope that the one we grieve to lose might resolve to stay. We have come flocking here like wild ducks among the reeds. They all stayed where they were, and everyone praised them to the skies. A departing traveler composed this. Sao sasedo, sokoi mo shiranu, watatsu tsumi no, fukaki kokoro o, kimi ni miru kana. As when a boatman seeks in vain to plumb the sea, thrusting with his oar, even so do we behold the boundless depths of your heart. The boat captain, an insensitive fellow, had as much as he wanted to drink and was anxious to leave. The tide is full, the wind's coming up, he shouted. As the travelers prepared to board the vessel, the well-wishers recited Chinese poems suitable to the season and occasion. Even though Tosa is a western province, someone also sang a song from Kai province. Magnificent singing, people said. The cabin dust is scattered and the clouds are standing still. That night we stayed at Urado where Fujiwara no Tokizane, Tachibana no Suehira, and some others overtook us. The 28th day. The boat rowing out from Urado, bound for Ominato. Meanwhile, Yamaguchi no Chimine, the son of one of the governor's predecessors in office, had arrived with wine and delicacies and set them on board, so we went on our way, drinking and eating. The 29th day. The night was spent at Ominato, the provincial medicinal officer came all the way to bring toso, byakusan, and even wine. 
it would seem that he was a very kind man. The first day of the month. Uh, the first day of the first month. Still in the same harbor. Someone had put the Byakusan up against the boat captain, thinking it would be safe overnight, but the wind gradually shifted it overboard, so nobody was able to have any. There were no dried taro stems, arame seaweed, or New Year's health dishes either. Such things are not ordinarily provided aboard boats, and the governor had not asked for them. People simply kissed the lips of pressed salt trout. Do you suppose the trout found it romantic? I can't help thinking about the capital today, everyone kept saying. I wonder how it all looks, the straw festoons with their mullet heads and holly at the gates of the little houses. The second day. Still at Ominato. The head monk said food and wine. Sent food and wine. The third day. Same place. The wind and waves seemed tiresome. The wind and waves seemed tiresomely reluctant to let us go. The fourth day. Winds prevented our departure. Masatsuda presented wine and delicacies. Unwilling to accept gifts with no return, the government did what little he could by way of recomp recompense. There was nothing to serve as a proper acknowledgement. The presents carried a prosperous atmosphere, but they were really a source of embarrassment. The fifth day. The winds and raves, waves refused to abate, so we remained in the same place. There was a steady stream of callers. The sixth day. Same as the day before. The seventh day. The seventh day came, with the boat still in the same harbor. People thought in vain about the white horse banquet being held that day. For us, waves were the only white things in sight. Meanwhile, someone who lived at a house called The Pond sent over a procession of servants shouldering long chests crammed with food. In addition to other things, the chests held funa and other river and sea fish, but no carp. There were young greens to serve as a reminder of the date, and also a very clever poem. Asaji no nobe ni shi areba, mizu mo naki ike ni tsumitsuru wakana narikeri. We dwell on a plain, where sparse kargon grasses grow, and thus these young greens have been gathered for your sake from a pond without water. Pond was a reference to the name of the place. Someone said a well-bred woman from the capital had come there with her husband to live. The food from the chest was distributed to everyone on board, including the children, and they all ate as much as they could. The sounds made by the sailors drumming on their bus bursting bellies were enough to wake the sea gods and raise the waves. A number of things happened during that period. A man appeared on the same day with some servants carrying partitioned lunch boxes. His name escapes me. I, I will remember it presently. This person had come because he wanted to recite a poem. After a little prelimi preliminary talk, he spoke, within, spoke up in a doleful voice. The waves are shockingly high, aren't they? He said. Then he produced his composition. Yuku saki ni tatsu shiranami no koe yori mo okurete nakamu ware ya masaramu. Exceeding the sound of the wind, white billows rising, where you are to go, even so will be my wails when you have left me behind. He must have had a loud voice. How well did his poem compare with the gifts he had bought? People said polite things, but nobody composed a reply. Although there were some who thought who were capable of doing so, they merely uttered words of praise and kept right along eating. After nightfall, the poet withdrew, announcing that he would return soon. Then, to everyone's surprise, a little girl, the child of one of the passengers, said softly, I'd like to answer the poem. That would be lovely. Can you really think of something? If so, let us hear it. I'll wait for the gentleman who went away. He said he wasn't leaving. Someone went in search of the man, but he had gone straight home after all, possibly because of the lateness of the hour. Well now, what was your poem going to be? An inquisitive person asked. At first the bashful child was too embarrassed to answer, but after much urging, she brought out these lines. Yuku hito mo, tomaru mo sode no, namigada wa, migi wa nomi koso. Nune masarite ikere. The river of tears, on the sleeve of one who goes, and one who remains, rise until they overflow, and make the beaches wetter. Imagine the child's composing such an excellent poem. We might have been less surprised if we had not been thinking of her as a mere sweet infant. We can't present it as a child's composition. It must seem to come from an older person, someone said. Right or wrong, it shall be sent at the first opportunity. The speaker apparently copied it down and saved it.
the eighth day. The boat remained in the same place because of an obstacle to our departure. As the moon sank into the sea that night, someone recalled Narihira's poem. Retreat, O rim of the hills, and refuse to let it set. If Narihira had been composing by the shore, I wonder if he might have said, Rear up, O waves of the sea, and refuse to let it set. With Narihira's poem in mind, a certain person composed such lines as these. Terutsuki no nagaruru mireba ama no kawa izuru minato wa umi ni zarikeru. Gazing at the course of the shining moon on high, we find that the mouth of the river of heaven is none other than the sea. The ninth day. The boat rode out from Ominato shortly before dawn on the ninth, bound for Nawa Harbor. Of the many people who have sparsely come to, who have come sparse, separately to say goodbye, eager to see the governor as long as he was still in the district, the most faithful had been Fujiwara no Tokizane, Tachibana no Suehira, and Hasebi no Yukimasa, who had followed him from place to place ever since his departure from the official residence. Those three has hearts, had hearts as deep as the ocean. Knowing that the boat was set to o out a across open water from Ominato, they had come for a final farewell. As the boat moved away, the passengers on the seashore shrank, and the passengers became invisible from the land. Those on the shore must have had things they wished to say, and those in the boat felt the same way, but nothing could be done about it. Someone murmured this poem to himself before turning his mind to other things. Omoe yaru, kokoro wa umi yo, watare domo, fumishi nakereba, shirazu ya aruramu. Are they unaware? of how I send my spirit, I who can neither walk there across the water, nor dispatch a letter. Presently, the boat passed the pine woods of Uda. It was impossible to imagine how many trees might be standing there, or how many thousands of years they might have lived. The waves came up to their roots, and cranes flew back and forth among the branches. Too deeply moved to admire the spectacle in silence, one of the passengers composed a poem that went something like this. Miwataseba Matsu no ure goto ni tsumu tsuru wa chiyo no dochi tozo omo ubera naru. They must think of them as friends for eternity, those cranes far away, dwelling where a pine tree offers a bow for home. The poem was not the equal of the scene. The boat moved on, with the passengers gazing at similar sights until shadows gathered over mountains and sea. As the night deepened, one direction seemed the same as another and everything concern, concerning the weather conditions had to be left to the captain's discretion. It was a depressing experience for any man unaccustomed to such journeys, and as for the women, they simply pressed their heads against the floorboards and wailed. But the sailors and captains roared out boat songs without a care in the world. For example, Here I sob in the fields of spring. Is an old man wolfing them now? Is an old mother-in-law eating them now? Those tender greens I picked while the young mechan my canthus, cut, cut my hands, kaeraya, just let me meet last night's girl again, I'll ask her for the money, she told a lie she bought on credit, and now she doesn't bring the money, she doesn't even show her face, there were many others that I will not record, the sound of laughter they elicited was a relief, the seas were rough but our nerves were somewhat calmed, we reached the harbor after traveling all day long, an old man and an old woman, who had suffered more than the rest of us, took to their beds without eating. The tenth day. This night was spent at Nawa Harbor. The eleventh day. The boat left for Murotsu before daybreak. Since everyone was still in bed, it was impossible to see the ocean. The best we could do was judge directions by the moon. Presently, the new day dawned. It was around noon by the time people had washed their hands and performed the usual offices. Just then the boat reached a place called Hane. Does Hane look like a bird's wing? Hane? Asked the child who had heard someone mention the name. Everyone laughed at the naive question, and a little girl, the same as before, composed a poem. Makoto ni te Nani kiku tokoro Hane naraba Tobu ga gotoku ni Miyako e mogana Even, if, true to its name, this place consisted of wings, how nice it would be to return to the city like a flock of birds. Exactly so, the others thought. Even though her composition was not very good, it was, it was remembered by men and women alike, for everyone longed to reach the capital as soon as possible. 
With her question about Hane, the child had stirred thoughts of another, no longer among the living, who was never forgotten. The mother seemed especially sad that day. Prompted by the reflection that those who had traveled to the province were not all returning, someone recalled the poem, not the full number, it seems, is making the journey home. He composed these lines. Yo no naka ni omoi yare domo ko koru omoi ni masaru omoi naki kana. Ponder as we may the sorrows of this bleak world. We find none more sharp than a grief of a parent feels, than the grief a parent feels mourning the loss of a child. And even as he spoke, the twelfth day. No rain. The boat carrying Funtoki and Koremichi, which had been delayed, reached Murotsu by the way of Narashi Harbor. The thirteenth day. A little rain fell before dawn on the thirteenth. It stopped after a while. The woman went ashore to bathe at a suitable place in the vicinity. Gazing out across the sea, someone composed a poem. Kumo mo mina. Nami tozo miru, miyuru. Ama mo ga na. Uzure ka umito. Toite shirubeku. Each fleecy white cloud assumes the guise of a wave. Oh, for a fisher to answer when we inquire. Which of them might be the sea? The gibbous moon was delightful. Out of fear of the sea god, none of the women had worn handsome deep red robes since boarding the vessel on the first day, but now, convinced that there was nothing to worry about, they found shelter of sorts behind a sparse stand of reeds, tucked up their skirts to their shins, and calmly displayed muscles and abalones. The fourteenth day. Rainfall, which began before daybreak, kept the boats in the same harbor. The cheap passenger abstained from eating flesh. In the absence of vegetarian foods, he broke his fast at noon with a sea bream caught on the previous day by the captain, to whom he gave some rice for lack of money. The same thing was done on later occasions. The captain brought sea bream again and received rice or wine several times, which he seemed to find agreeable. The fifteenth day. To the disappointment of all, no bean gruel was made on this day. Furthermore, the boat had now been inching along for more than 20 days because of bad weather. Finding no better way of passing time, people stared absently at the sea. A little girl recited a poem. Tateba tatsu, ireba mata iru, fukukaze to, nami to wa omou, dochi ni ya aruramu. When it rises, they rise along with it. When it rests, they rest. Might the two of them be friends, the blowing wind and the waves? It was a suitable composition for a child. The sixteenth day. We stayed in the same place, detained by continuing high winds and waves. Everyone kept wishing for calm seas and a quick passage around the cape. Someone composed a poem as he watched the surging waves. Shimo dani mo, okanu katazo to, iu naredo, nami no naka ni wa, yuki zo furikeru. In these parts, they say, the nights are not cold enough even to set frost, and yet we see fallen snow, white among the ocean waves. Twenty-five days had passed since we boarded the boat. The seventeenth day. The dark clouds cleared to reveal the delightful late night moon, and the crew took the boat out and began to row. Sea and sky seemed to merge. It was not without reason that the old man of, that the man of old said, I believe, something like this. The oar strikes through the moon on the waves. The boat presses against the sky and the sea. But I know little about such things. Someone composed this poem. Mina soko no tsuki no ue yori kogo fune no sao ni sawari wa katsura narura narurashi. A cinnamon tree. Surely it is no other catching the oar of the boat rowing over the moon in the watery depths. Someone who had been listening recited this. Kage mireba nami no soko naru hisakata no sore sora kogi wataru warezo wabishiki. With a forlorn heart, I gaze into the moonlight, where beneath the waves stretches a limitless sea to be traversed by this boat. Day finally dawned while such poems were being recited. Some black clouds have come out out of nowhere, the captain announced. The wind is going to blow. I'm taking the boat back. A depressing rain fell as the boat returned to the harbor. 
the eighteenth day. Still in the same place, the boat could not be taken out while the waves were so rough. The scenery at the harbor was very nice, both in the distance and closer at hand, but everyone was too miserable to appreciate it. I got the impression that some of the men were reciting Chinese poems, possibly in order to cheer themselves up. Someone composed this as a way of killing time. Isofuri no Yosuru iso ni wa Toshitsuki o Itsu tomo wa kanu Yuki no mu zofuru Snow falls constantly, with no regard for the season, on the wind wild seashore, where great breakers thunder in to shatter against the rocks. It was the poem of a person unaccustomed to composition. Someone also composed this. Kaze ni yoru Nami no isu ni wa Ugu isu mo Hanu mo ishiranu Eshiranu Hana no mizosaku Forever blooming on rocky strands where the wind drives the wild waves home, flowers unfamiliar to the warbler and to spring. The elderly chief passenger, intrigued by the efforts of others, tried some lines of his own, which he hoped might relieve the gloomy atmosphere of the past weeks. Tatsunami o Yuki ka hanaka to Fukukaze zo Yosetsu hito o Hakarubera naru it seemed to intend to deceive our human eyes. The wind blows waves forever toward the seashore, to break like snow, like blossoms. After listening intently to the comments on the poems, a certain person produced one that proved to contain 37 syllables. To his indignation, everyone bursts out laughing. One would try in vain to recite such a poem. Even if it were written down, it would be impossible to read. If it was so difficult on the very day of its composition, imagine what it would be like later. The 19th day. The weather was too bad for the boat to leave. The 20th day. Same as the preceding day, the boat failed to leave. Everyone was worried and gloomy. The passengers' nervousness and depression made them count the days until their fingers almost cramped. How many has it been today? 20? 30? They were too miserable to sleep at night. The 20th night moon appeared. With no mountain rim from which to emerge, it seemed to rise out of the sea. Just such a sight much have greeted the eyes of Abe no Nakamaru when he prepared to return home from China long ago. At the place where Nakamaru was to board the ship, the Chinese gave him a farewell party, lamenting the separation and composing poems in their language. The moon rose from the sea as they lingered there, seemingly reluctant to let him go. Nakamaru recomposed a composition in Japanese, remarking, such poems have been composed by the gods in our country ever since the divine age. Nowadays, people of all classes compose them when they regret the necessity of parting, as we are doing, and when they feel joy or sorrow. Aou na bara, furi sake mireba, kazu ga naru, mikasa no yama ni, ide shi tsuki kamo. When I gaze far out, across the blue-green sea plain, I see the same moon that appeared above the hills, of Mikasa at Kasuga. Nakamaru had feared that the poem would be unintelligible to the Chinese, but he wrote down its gist and characters and explained it to someone who understood our language, and, they, and then it received unexpectedly warm praise. They may have been able to appreciate his emotion, after all. Although China and this country use different languages, moonlight must look the same in both places, and thus it must evoke the same human feelings. With those in mind, someone composed, Miyako ni te. It is the same moon I saw at the captain at the mountain rim in the capital, yet now it comes from the waves and into the waves retreats. The 21st day. Our boat set out around the hour of the hare, 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. All others left too giving the appearance of scattered autumn leaves on the springtime sea. Thanks, it may be, to the fervent prayers we had offered, it proved to be a beautiful, calm day as we rode along. A child who had come with the party, asking to be used as a servant, sang a touching boat song. And still, and still, I can't help looking far into the distance, toward my homeland, when I think that there my father lives, there my mother lives. Kaere, kae, daraya, kare. The boat moved on, with the passengers listening to such songs, and presently we reached a rock 
where a flock of black birds had gathered. White waves broke at the base. White waves approach black birds, the captain said. It was not a particularly felicitous phrase, but it had a literary ring. One was struck by it because it did not seem to fit the man's station in life. The boat continued its progress while similar remarks were being exchanged. Gazing at the waves, the chief passenger said, Ever since our departure from the province, I have been worrying about rumors that pirates that the pirates plan to seek revenge. And then the sea has been terrifying. My hair has gone completely white. I see now that the ocean can make a man turn 70 or 80 years old. Waga kami no, yuki to isobe no, shiranami to, izure, masareri, okitsu, shimamori. Tell me, guardian of Yon Island in the sea, which is the whiter, the snow covering my head, or the waves on a rocky shore? Captain, I rely on you to transmit my message. The 22nd day. We headed from the previous night's harbor towards another stopping place. Mountains were visible in the distance. A boy of nine, younger for his age, noticed that the hills seemed to be moving with the boat. To everyone's surprise, he composed a poem. Kogite yuku, fune ni te mireba, ashihiki no, yama sae yuku o matsu wa shirazu ya. Gazing from the boat, as it goes rowing along, we see that the hills, the very hills, are moving. Don't the pine trees know it? It was a suitable poem for a child. The sea was choppy that day. Snow fell on rocky shores and waves and wave flowers blossomed. Someone composed this. Nami to nomi. Hitotsu ni kikedo. Iro mireba. Yuki to hana to ni. Magai kiru kana. Our ears tell us waves, waves alone, yet our eyes, observing their hue, lead us into confusion with snowflakes and blossoms. The 23rd day. Sunshine followed by clouds. Prayers were offered to the gods and Buddhas because there was said to be danger from pirates in the area. The 24th day. Same place as the preceding day. The 25th day. The captains having pronounced the north winds unfavorable, the boats were not taken out. People kept saying the pirates were pursuing us. The 26th day. Whether it was true or not, I can't say. But there were rumors that pirates were on our trail. This caused us to delay our departure until around midnight. As the boat proceeded, we came to a place where the travelers make offerings to the gods for a safe journey. The captain was commissioned to present strips of, of sacred cloth. The offerings went flying towards the east, and he prayed, Grant that the boat may travel swiftly in the direction taken by the sacred strips. A little girl who was listening composed a poem. Watatsumi no chifuri no kami ni a wind scattering, the sacred strips we present, to the gods who protect, travelers on the broad sea, may your blowing never cease. Meanwhile, elated by the fair wind, the captain gave orders to hoist the sail. The flapping noise delighted the children and old women, possibly because of their eagerness to reach the capital. One of the group, the Awaji grandmother, composed a poem. Oikaze no, fuki nuru toki wa, yuku funi no, fune no, hote uchite koso, ureshi kare kare kari kere. Now that fair winds blow, we clap our hands joyously, echoing the sound of halyards clattering as the vessel speeds along. The captain offered prayers for fine weather. The 27th day. The wind and wave grew high, so the boat was not taken out. There were despairing sighs in all quarters. The men attempted to amuse themselves with Chinese poetry. A woman composed this waka after hearing caught of the gist of a verse that sounded something like, when I look at the sun, the capital seems far away. Hio dani mo, amaku mo chikaku, miru mono o, miyako e to mu, michi no harikesa. Even the far sun rides close to the heavenly clouds and, yet how distant, is the end of this journey toward the longed for capital. Someone else recited Fukukaze no Tae nu kagiri shi Tachi kureba Namiji wa ito do Haruke kari kiri. Because the white waves will certainly rise above their heads whenever the wind blows.
Long indeed must be our trip across the billowing sea. The wind blew all night, all day long, and the passengers went to bed snapping their fingers in vexation. The 28th day. It rained all night and into the morning. The 29th day. The boat was taken out. We were rowed along in bright sunlight. Noticing that my nails had grown excessively long, I reckoned up the days and found that it was a day of the rat. Thus, I refrained from cutting them. Since it was the first month, people began to talk of the day of the rat in the capital. Wouldn't it be nice to have a little pine tree, someone said. But that was scarcely possible on the open sea. One of the women jotted down a poem, which she showed around. Obotsukana, kyo wa ne no hika, ama nareba, umimatsu o dani, hikamashi mono o. How unreal it seems. Is this the day of the rat? Were I a fisher, then I might at least uproot the pine of the sea. But alas, what shall we say of that day as a rat? What shall we say of that as a day of the rat poem composed at sea? Someone else composed this. Kyo naredo wakana mo tsumazu kazugano no waga koi wataru ura ni nakereba. Though it is today, I cannot even pick greens, for on the beach I pass in this rowing craft, there is no Kasuga plain. The boat proceeded on its way amid such talk. Presently we approached a beautiful spot. Where are we? someone asked. Tosa Harbor. Among the passengers there was a woman who had once lived in a place called Tosa. Ah, <sighs> she sighed. It has the same name as the Tosa where I lived long ago. She recited this poem. Toshigoro o sumushi tokoro no nanishi o eba kiyoru nami o aware tozomiru. It bears the same name as the place in which I lived, while the years went by, and thus I feel affection, even for its approaching waves. The thirtieth day. No rain or wind. We left around midnight, having heard that the pirates were inactive at night and began to negotiate the Awa Strait Whirlpool. It was too dark to tell one direction from another, but we managed to get through, with both sexes praying frantically to the gods and Buddhas. We passed Nushima Island around the hour of the tiger, 3 a.m. to 5 a.m., or the hour of the hare, 5 a.m. to 7 a.m., and then Tanakawa. And by traveling at full speed, we reached a place called Izumi no Nada. The gods and Buddhas must have been blessing us, for the sea was almost perfectly calm that day. It was our 39th on board the boat. Now that we had reached Izumi province, pirates were no longer a threat. Mm. The first day of the second month. Rain fell in the morning. When it stopped around the hour of the horse, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., we set out from Izumi no Nada. As on the preceding day, the surface of the sea was calm and windless. We traveled past the Kurosaki, Black Cape Pine Woods, with the name of the place black, the color of the pines green, the waves on the rocky beach snow white, and the shells red, we lacked only one of the five colors, yellow. Meanwhile, at a place called Hakono Ura, Bay of Boxes, the sailors began to pow us with tow rope. As we were progressing in that manner, someone recited a poem. Tamakushige, Hakono Ura Nami, Tatanu Hiwa, Umi o kagami to tare ka mizaramu. When, the wa when waves are thus calm, in this bay that calls to mind gemmed box combs, who could fail to find the sea exactly like a mirror? To think a new month has begun, the chief passenger sighed. Miserably depressed, he decided to cheer himself up with a poem, since someone else had already recited one. Hikufune no tsunade no nagaki haru no hi o Yosoka ikamade, ware wa heniki keri. Forty or fifty are the days I have endured, spring days stretching out as long as the long tow rope with which sailors pull our boat. It would seem that those who heard his comp composition began to make private remarks about its lack of ingenuity, but they were only a few whispers after someone warned. He went through a lot of trouble over that poem, and he's probably proud of it. I'll be annoyed if he hears you. The wind and waves suddenly arose, forcing the boat to stop. The second day. 
The wind and high seas continued. People prayed to the gods and Buddhas all through the day and night. The third day. The sea remained the same as on the day before, preventing the sailors from taking the boat out. The ceaseless wind seemed to roll back the waves as they approached the shore. Someone was moved to compose a poem. O o yorite, kai nakimono wa ochitsumoru, namida no tama o nukanu narikeri. What good it might do to make thread of twisted hemp? We cannot use it to string the jewel-like tears we shed in such abundance. So the day ended. The fourth day. The captain refused to take the boat out, pronouncing the wind and clouds too threatening, but the elements remained calm all day long. The stupid fellow couldn't even predict the weather. There are many beautiful shells and rocks of all kinds on the shore of that harbor. Someone on board, lonely as always, for an absent child, recited, Yosuru nami, uchi mo yosunamu. Waga koru, hitu wasure kai, orite, hiroamu. You incoming waves wash ashore the forgetting shells that may bring surcease for longing for my dear love. I will go and gather them. Too deeply affected to remain silent and hopefully also of relieving the gloom on board, a certain person composed this. Wasure gai, hiroi shimo seiji, shiratama o. I shall not gather seashells for forgetfulness, but make a keepsake of this longing for a child, as fair as a precious white pearl. Grief for a daughter seems to damage a parent's powers of judgment. Some may object that the girl could not have been, a, been as pretty as a pearl, but there is also an old saying, the dead child had a beautiful face. One of the women composed this poem, unhappy because day after day was being spent in the same place. The days have gone by in this Izumi, a spring, where sleeves can be soaked with no feeling of coldness, where no water can be drawn. The fifth day. On this day, the boat finally left Izumi no Nada for Ozu Harbor. Pine woods stretched before us as far as the eye could see. The whole party got heartily sick of them, and someone composed a poem. Yukedo nao, yuki areru wa, imu ga imu omu umu. Ozo no ure naru kishi no matsubara. On and on we press, yet we cannot journey past pine trees on the shore, fringing the bay of Ozu, known for the sharp, fair pit spinners of hemp. Such was the talk as we moved along. Take advantage of the good weather. Row as fast as you can, the governor urged. Orders from His Excellency, the, cabin said to, the captain said to the crew. Hurry up and get the tow rope going before the morning mother, motherly, northerly pat begins. His speech sounded like a poem, but was quite spontaneous and uncalculated. That's odd. He seems to have recited a poem, said someone who had been listening. The speaker wrote down the words. There were indeed 31 syllables. The wind and raves, waves remained tranquil in response to the pleas of the passengers, who prayed throughout the day for calm seas. The boat came to a place where a flock of seagulls was at play, and one of the children recited this poem, happy at being so close to the capital. Inori kuru, inori kuru, kazama to mou, ayanaku mo, kamome saida ni, nami to miyuramu. The wind has died down in divine recognition of our many petitions. But why should we seem to see white waves where the seagulls flock? As we journeyed on, we saw delightful pine-covered shores stretching far into the distance at a place called Ishiizu. Then the boats passed Sumiyoshi, and someone recited, Ima mite zo, mioba shirinuru, sumi no e no, matsu yori saki ni, ware wa henikiri, henikeri. What I now behold informs me of my true plight. I am older still than the venerable pines on Suminoe's beaches. The dead child's mother, who never forgot her for a day or an hour, composed this. Suminoe ni fune sashi yose yo wasuregusa shirushi ari yato tsumite yukubeku. Please take the boat in to the Suminoe shore. Before we journey on, I will pluck forgetting grass to test the truth of its name.
It is unlikely that she wanted to forget completely. She was probably seeking temporary relief from her longing, hoping to regain the strength to bear it. We were proceeding in that way, composing poems and admiring the, the scenery, when a wind blew up. Although the sailors rowed with all their might, the boat was steadily forced backwards, and we were soon in imminent danger of sinking. The bright divinity of Sumiyoshi is like all the gods. He must want something, the captain said. How modern of a god to be so covetous. Please make an offering of sacred strips, the captain said. We did as he asked, but the storm showed no sign of abating, and the wind and waves reached an ominous heights. The captain spoke up again. He isn't satisfied with the strips, that's why he won't let his excellency's boat proceed. Please give him something nice enough to make him happy. The governor felt compelled to obey. Precious though my eyes are, I have two of them. I'll give the god my one mirror, he said. With a heavy heart, he threw the mirror into the sea, and the surface itself instantly became like a mirror. Someone composed a poem. Tihayaburu, kami no kokoro o aruru umi ni kagami o irete katsumitsuru kana. I cast a mirror into the turbulent waves of the raging sea, and the thing it reflected was the heart of the mighty god. It was certainly not the same god people praised with the talk of Sumi Noe, limpid inlet, forgetting grass and young shore pines. I saw his heart clearly in the mirror. It was the same as the captain's. The Sixth Day After setting out from our channel marker, we arrived at Naniwa and entered the Yodo River. All the passengers, and especially the elderly men and women, raised their hands to their foreheads in an excess of joy. In her delight at hearing that it was no longer far from the capital, the seasick old Awaji grandmother lifted her head from the village and recited a poem. Recited a poem. Itsu shikato, ibuse karitsuru, nani wagata, ashi kogi tsukete, mifuni kinkie. Now the August boat comes at last to the inlet. To long-awaited Naniwa, with its oars, pushes its way through the reeds. Everyone was amazed to hear a poem from so unexpected a source. The ailing chief passenger was particularly impressed. A fine composition, he said. Quite a contrast with the seasick face we saw earlier. The seventh day. On this day, we got welled up. We got welled up the river, but were dismayed to find the water level failing as we rowed further from the sea. It is no easy task for a boat to ascend a river. The chief passenger was still feeling ill. Furthermore, he was unrefined man, ignorant of the art of composition. But he decided to try a poem, possibly from a combination of admiration for the old lady's feet and relief at being near the capital. This was rather eccentric result of this was the rather eccentric result of his labors. Kitokite wa kawa no boriji no mizu o asami fune mo wa gami mo nazumo kyo kana. Despite our great haste, the water is but shallow in this river course, and thus the boat, like myself, goes indifferently today. He must have been thinking of his indisposition when he composed it. Since a single palm was not enough to express all his sentiments, he produced another. Tokoto omu, fune nayamasu wa wagatame ni mizu no kokoro no asaki narikei. That it labors so the boat I would see speed on, is surely because the river's feeling for me is as shallow as its waters. The poem was probably inspired by a desire to show his joy at the, the proximity of the capital. Recognizing that it was inferior to the Awaji woman's, he was impatient with himself for composing it. Meanwhile, night settled down and everyone went to bed. The Eighth Day Struggling onward up the river, we spent the night near Torikai Pasture. The chief passenger's illness flared up after dark, causing him acute distress. Someone brought fresh fish, for which rice was given in return. The men apparently whispered among themselves that it was a case of hatching a bluefish with a grain of rice. It was not the first time such an exchange had taken place, but the fish went to waste because it was a day of abstinence. The Ninth Day With the sailors manning the tow rope, we started upriver again before dawn, full of eager anticipation, but the extreme dearth of water forced us to crawl along. At a place called Wadaport Junction, some people asked for rice and fish, which we gave them. Later, as the sailors continued to pull the boat upstream, we were able to see Nagisa House. It was a delightful sight for nostalgic eyes. Pine groves stood on the hill to the rear, and plum trees blossomed, bloomed in the inner garden. People remarked that it was a famous old spot, and someone said it was the place where Ariwa no Narihiri, Ariwara no Narihira, the middle captain, composed this poem when he visited it with Prince Kore, Koretaka. Yo no naka ni 
耐えて桜の咲かざれば春の心はのどけかりまし。If ours were a world in which flowering cherry trees were never in bloom, what tranquility would bless the human heart in springtime? A member of our party recited some lines appropriate to the setting. しようへたる。松にはあれど。いにしえの。こえの。さむさは。かわらざりけり。Although the pine trees have endured a thousand years, there has been no change in the cold voice of the wind, blowing as in bygone days. Someone also composed this. きみこえて。ようふるやどの。うめのはな。昔のかにぞ、なお、においける。Blossoms of the plum, nostalgic for their master at the old dwelling, bloom with the same sweet fragrance as in times now long past. We continued upstream, rejoicing in the thought that the capital was drawing ever nearer. There had only been one child in the governor's party on the journey from the capital to Tosa, but a number of women had given birth in the province. After watching the parents as they carried their youngsters off the boat, And back on again at the various stops, the dead child's grieving mother recited a poem. Nakari s h i m o Ari t s u t s u k a r e r u Hiru no ko o Ari s h i m o nakute, Kuru ga kanashi sa. Even those others, who went out with no children, return as parents. How bitter that a mother should come home with empty arms. She began to weep. How must the father have felt as he listened? Such poems are not composed for pleasure. Both in China and on our land, they spring from emotion too strong to be born. We stopped at Udon all that night. The tenth day. Something prevented us from continuing up the river. I don't know that way too fast. Okay. The tenth day. Something prevented us from continuing up the river. The eleventh day. A light rain stopped after a time. Traveling upstream, we saw a mountain just ahead to the east, which proved upon inquiry to be the site of Yawata Shrine. Everyone offered joyful prayers. Then the Yamazaki Bridge came into view, and our happiness knew no bounds. The boat was halted briefly in the vicinity of Soji Temple so that some decisions could be made. A great many willows bordered the river near the temple, and their reflections in the water suggested a poem. Sazere nami, yosuru aya no wa, aoyagi no, kagi no ito shite, oru ka tozo miru. One might imagine. Reflected young willow threads, weaving the pattern, tranced by incoming ripples on the surface of the stream. The twelfth day. We spent the night at Yamazaki. The thirteenth day. Still at Yamazaki. The fourteenth day. Rain fell. On this day, someone was sent to the capital to fetch carriages. The fifteenth day. People came bringing carriages. Depressed by shipboard life, the governor moved to a private residence where he was entertained with every appearance of delight. The owner's hospitality was indeed so marked as to seem almost excessive. Various kinds of return gifts were presented. The members of the household were most well bred and proper. The 16th day. Setting out for the capital toward, toward evening on this day, we noticed that there had been no changes in the pictures of small boxes at Yamazaki or in the shapes of the big fish hooks at Magari. But as they say, Who knows what's in a shopkeeper's heart? As we continued toward the capital, someone entered, entertained us at Shimasaka. There was no particular reason for him to do so. People were more hospitable during the return journey than when we traveled to Tosa. We gave return gifts to this host as well. Wishing to enter the city after nightfall, we went along at a leisurely pace. Presently, the moon rose, and we crossed at the Katsura River by its light. Since this is not the Asuka, its pools and rapids haven't changed at all, people said. Someone composed a poem. Hi Sakata no Tsuki ni oitaru Katsura ga ga wa Soku naru kage mo Kawarazaki Kawarazari kiri. There has been no change, not even in the moonlight, on the Katsura, the river whose name calls the celestial cinnamon tree. Someone also composed this Amakumo no Haruka naritsuru Katsura ga wa So de o h i d e t e mo Watariru 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 Riru Kana. Now I have crossed it, drenched my sleeve as I passed. Katsura Gawa, the stream that once seemed as distant as clouds in the firmament. This was also composed. 
桂川。我が心にも、かよわねど、同じ深さに、流るべらなり。No affinity guides the katsura through my heart's channels, yet in depth it seems the same as this flood of happiness. Too much elation at returning to the capital had resulted in too much poetry. Because we were arriving late at night, the familiar faces were not visible, but it was a joy merely to make out our way deeper into the city. When we reached the house and entered the gate, the surroundings stood out clearly in the bright moonlight. The disrepair was terrible, far worse than what we had been told. The conscience of the people to whom the governor had entrusted the house were obviously as in bad a shape as the buildings themselves. There was a boundary fence between the house and the one next door. But the two were like a single establishment, so the neighbors had volunteered to look after things. It was not an onerous responsibility, but still the government had sent them presents at every opportunity. Nevertheless, he refused to let his people utter noisy complaints that night. Heartless as the neighbors had shown themselves, he made up his mind to thank them. There had been a strand of pine trees beside a pond of sorts, but half of them had died and new ones had crowded in. One wondered if their thousand year lifespan had somehow been exhausted in five or six years. The sheer desolation of the scene invoked exclamations of grief and despair. Memories came flooding back. Among many sad, nostalgic thoughts, the most poignant were of the little girl, born in that house, who had not returned with the party. The children of others from that boat, chattering and shouting in noisy groups, made the grief of a certain person more unbearable than ever. He murmured a poem to someone who understood his feelings. Umare shi mo, kaerar mono o, waga yado ni komatsu no aru o. What sadness to see how young pine trees have sprung up inside the garden of one who is bereft, even of a child once born. He also composed this, possibly because his feelings still demanded expression. Mishi hito no matsu no chito se ni mimashikaba toku kanashiki wakare semashia. If the child's lifespan had been a pine's thousand years, that distant parting, that sad, eternal farewell, would never have happened. It is hopeless to try to record all the unforgettable and painful things that come to mind. After all, I suppose, the best thing to do is to tear up these sheets at once. Translation from Helen Craig McCullough. Okay, thank you, Nicole, for that uh, wonderful, smooth, beautiful reading of uh, Tosaniki, excerpts from Tosaniki. Uh, we will discuss more about it in class. I will um, see you all then, and there. Goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs>